Um, I want to walk you through sort of four relatively specific set of st strategies and tactics um, that we went through at MyEDU building out a core capability, that profile, uh, and then talk a little bit about some of the trials and tribulations of that. Um, and I'm going to start with this notion of contextual research. I hope I don't need to ex explain what contextual research is. Instead, I'm going to show how it works. Um, but this was specifically contextual inquiry or ethnography in the context of college students. Um, so we went into their dorm rooms um, with their permission, obviously. We talked to them. We went through their bags. Um, they showed us around their apartments. We watched TV with them. We did their homework. Um, and we spent a bunch of time with them learning what it's like to be, you know, 18, 19 years old these days. We did non-traditional students. Um, they're all non-traditional, by the way, at this point. Um, but we did non-traditional students, traditional students. We did students at private colleges, for-profits, the whole nine yards. Um, and I'll share with you just a couple anecdotes. Um, I'm going to read this verbatim. Your resume is like your life. It's your golden ticket to the chocolate factory. I like to book customer service and management things and stuff like that on my resume. Everyone has a business degree these days, so I'll always be able to get a job. I found out about the international business major from a guy at the Gap. I didn't even know what it was. I Googled it, and it sounded better than regular business, so I just picked that. My life's decisions are based on stupid things. Oh. Well, I hope you're applauding for Samantha, because I'm showing you this not to ridicule Samantha. I actually think that um, Samantha's dead on. Her life decisions are based on stupid things. So are the rest of ours. That's how it works. Um, she acknowledged it at 21. Um, maybe it took the rest of us longer than that. Um, but we heard this over and over and over. We heard college students tell us they picked accounting because it was the first one in the drop down. OK? I mean, like, <laughs> it, they, pick, they pick their degree because it's time to pick your degree, not because they have any idea of what they want to do. OK? And that's the norm. Um, and you learn stuff like this by spending time with them, okay? So qualitative research. We also spend a bunch of time with recruiters. Um, this, it's really hard to see in the washed out screen here, but it's, it's actually a squirrel and it's purple. It's a purple squirrel. And it was hanging on the wall in a recruiter's office and we asked about it um, and they explained to us that the purple squirrel is, is like the rare, perfect candidate, okay? I want a squirrel, there's lots of squirrels. I want a purple squirrel, okay? That means they gotta be able to do um, coding and design and marketing and uh, they have to be willing to work remote and overseas and they, they, don't, they don't want a lot of money and they'll work for, you know, crazy hours. That purple squirrel, that's what I want. Okay. Um, in, in her words, one of the recruiters told us that um, when it comes to, to picking jobs, students say, they say to themselves, um, I could do anything. I think I could do this, I could do that. Sort of a generalist approach. You couldn't say something worse to a recruiter. Okay. Don't apply to five of my jobs because you're not going to get any of them. Okay, so she observes students sort of aimlessly saying, I don't know what to do, so I will apply for every job on the internet. And she's going, I'm looking for a purple squirrel. There's clearly a problem there. Okay. Um, so the way that we went through this was pretty simple, straightforward contextual research. We identified our participants. Uh, we went through a plan. We talked to them. Um, and uh, we observed behavior. And I think the key here for this whole thing is observing behavior, not just having interviews. Okay? We actually watch them engage with the software at their schools. We watch them look for jobs. We watch them go through their coursework. Okay? And it's different. You build empathy, not understanding. Okay, so then, then we moved on to synthesis. This is my um, favorite part of the process, mostly because it's just a mess. This is our war room. It probably looks like the rest of y'all's war rooms. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Um, these are individual utterances. I was pleased to hear a couple other speakers sort of talk about the rigor of their synthesis. Like, that's starting to be a thing, which is awesome. Um, I'll zoom in even more. So um, we transcribe all of the research, right, all of the three and a half or four hour long individual sessions with all of our students. Um, and then we blow them out using, here's the trick of the day, a mal merge in Excel. Right? Whoa, now I can make labels. It's just like that easy. Um, and you print the suckers out, you put them on the wall, and then you can move them around, and you find patterns, and you find anomalies, and you start to see the data in a way that you didn't see it before. Okay, you literally marinate in the data. Um, and this is a quote from uh, that recruiter. Right? This is the raw data. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you can tell in the corner, but it has a, a line number that references the transcript. So later, when we come up with the world's best idea, we can cite it back to her and say, thank you very much. Send her a nice card. Um, that's also a joke. Kind of. Um, and the method there is super simple, right? It just takes forever. Okay? You transcribe all the research, and you transcribe the research rather than outsourcing it because I can literally hear in my head the voice of Samantha. I can channel her. 
and I can start to anticipate how she'd react to situations with some degree of confidence. Okay? I can feel what it's like to be Samantha because I spent hours hearing her voice as she went through that interview and I transcribed it word for word. Okay? Then we explode that data, we identify the groupings, and we start to identify anomalies. Um, again, sort of uh, standard, I suppose, in design strategy circles, like so far. Um, and then we get to behavioral insights, and I think this is actually where the, the magic happens or where the rubber hits the road or whatever you want to call it. Um, so really hard to see here, but I'm reiterating the chocolate factory quote from Samantha, okay? Um, and below that, uh, also hard to see, bullets around how she emphasizes bullets on a resume, right? She went to the career service office, she wrote a resume, and she bulleted out what she does, okay? And she feels like that's sufficient. Um, she thinks it's better to take the scattershot buckshot approach. There you go, you can see it all. On the other side of things, we have Meg, right, our recruiter, um, who's gonna say, don't apply to any of my five jobs because you're not gonna get them, right? You do this buckshot approach, I don't want it. Um, for her, she has this split second way of judging a candidate and we watched her do it um, based on um, the font they used on the resume, based on their hair, based on their, um, the way they describe themselves and their objective. Uh, no, not a good fit. Not a, oh, that's an interesting candidate, we'll put that over here. Okay, very quick. She's looking for specific keywords, specific skills, and more than anything, at a college level, she's looking for evidence. Right? She doesn't believe them. She's looking for evidence that the student can do what they say they can do, or proof. Bullets on a resume don't cut it for her. And then she creates a mental narrative of what a candidate can do and carries that with her. Okay? So we have two sides of the story here, um, and they bubble up to these insight statements. Okay? These insight statements are the magic, so let me read them out loud. Um, on the student side, our student insight is that students think they have an idea of what employers want in a candidate, and they're wrong. On the employer side, or recruiter side, recruiters make snap judgments about candidates, and that directly impacts their chance of success. These are provocative statements of truth, even though we're basing them on a really small, totally biased, qualitative research study. We're creating a scaffold, you call it a house of cards if you want, upon which we're gonna build a great idea. And we're treating it like it's a fact. Right? This is where we just moved into the stuff of abductive reasoning or intuition. Cool, so that's the fun stuff. Here's how you do it, just ask why. Right? Provoke the question why and then answer it even if you don't have enough data. Don't go, oh, I need to do a, you know, a quant survey or longitudinal study or I'm just not really ready to answer it. Answer it. Channel the person you spent time with and answer it as if they were there. And make that inferential leap and frame it as a declarative, definitive statement of truth. This is a fact. And then those behavioral insights directly lead us to a value proposition. And the value proposition is where you can fully put on your product management hat. These are our insights. We're gonna sort of build on top of them and reflect on them. We have the student here who's thinking of things like, I don't know if I have any skills. I don't think I have any skills. I don't know how to show skills. Um, we heard that over and over and over as people were showing us capabilities and going, I'm not skilled in anything. It's like, yeah, it's right, it's right in front of you. You're doing it. You're doing it, Peter. It's important to be viewed as having a broad set of interests. They view, they view this generalist approach as much more critical than being a specialist. Um, I think college students are convinced that the um, entire recruiting process is like a big black box and magic, black magic, and people are waving their hands. Um, and, uh, and they've been told over and over and over that if you have a good cover letter and a resume, you're in. Right? This is the mental space in which students operate in terms of jobs and, and recruiting. Um, on the other side of things, we have this recruiter who's like, um, no, give me the purple squirrel. I'm looking to match that really specific skill set. Um, and I need to see evidence or proof that you can do the things you say you can do, all right? Um, I'm gonna build this story of you that may or may not be true, but then I'm gonna stick to it. And by the way, don't waste my time because I'm really busy, okay? So we have this ecosystem. And the ecosystem actually creates a what if opportunity because there's a chasm between these two people, these two roles, these two constituents. And so we can ask the question, what if we help students identify their skills and present them to employers in a credible way? Right? That's our what if moment. Recast that as a value proposition. My EDU helps students identify the skills and present them to employers in a credible way. That's a promise. It, it becomes a promise, right? But put another way, I use my EDU, my EDU and my expectation is that it's gonna help me do this. And if it doesn't, I'm let down, just like when my electricity goes out. Okay. 
well, great, now we have a value proposition. It's grounded in behavior, and it makes sense. So let's do something with it. Uh, let's define some features, and now we're in pragmatic product management mode. Um, this is some, somewhat of a bucketing exercise of, hey, what are all the capabilities we could do to help achieve that value proposition? And you can see on the side, we're saying, well, we got this profile card. What if students can add skills to it? And at the end, we're like, well, we want to display the skill on the profile. Well, what are all the mechanisms we can use in our product suite to do that? Um, they could browse for skills. They could search for skills. We could recommend skills. Um, you could acquire skills through your e-learning. Um, you could buy skills at the skills store. I don't know. There's all sorts of different ways that you could get this to happen. Um, and so we brainstormed it all. Here's, here's just a couple, you know, small subset of it. And then we down-selected that because, um, like everyone else who's building product, especially at a startup, we had a development resource issue. Right? We didn't have enough developers to do it all because you never have enough developers to do it all. Um, and so we said, all right, here's the critical path. Sometimes this is called MVP. I don't, I don't necessarily like MVP um, because it implies that you're, you're sort of done at the minimal stage. Um, I want that, the maximal viable product. Um, this is just the first step toward it. Okay? Um, and so we built this out. Um, and when we build it out, we do our standard product devs. Like, this is Agile Stories, Jira, the whole crappy nine yards of, like, the, the sloth of building software. Um, a little bit different. You know, designers still do their thing. We're attaching comps, and they look like this, and they're beautiful. Um, and, uh, and thinking through the visual aesthetics and the wireframes and all that kind of, you know, sporting artifacts. Um, but fundamentally, all of this backs up to the value proposition, right? The features we're selecting match the value proposition, which was extracted from the insights, which came directly from the behavioral research. And then we launched it. And this is where, when you're a product manager, you're like, oh my god, this is crack. Right? This is the best thing in the world. Launching product is amazing. Um, we built into our launch plan a daily report. And so this is uh, the daily metric of profile growth and membership growth. Um, because when your product is out in the world and people are using it, you can get data about what they're doing. It's different than when you create a flashlight um, it goes to tooling. Six months later, it arrives on a, on a ship, and they sell it at Walmart. Right? The customer insights are delayed, they're lagged, and they're not very rich. Um, I get all the customer insights from this. Right? I get all the data I want. Um, this is an, uh, an overview of the skills that students were adding. I'll let you sort of absorb it and then make your own determinations about the future of our country. Um, I mean, leadership is in the top three, so that's good, right? <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, so we get data, right? You become awash in data, which is awesome, because now you can start to change the product. You can actually iterate and create product extensions, and you can do it quickly. 